Thank you very much for this wonderful invitation and this generous opportunity to share work. Um, I'd like to, as I um, share my screen, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I teach at, uni at a university which is um, Northwestern University, which is located on lands that were on lands that were um, uh, appropriated from the indigenous people, specifically the Council of Three Fires, including the Miami, the Ho Chunk, and the Menominee peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Dominica, which was also the ancestral home of the Kalinago people and was also the a site of refuge for displaced peoples, uh, both African and indigenous, seeking refuge from genocide and captivity. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to briefly talk about the work I've been doing and continue to do in Dominica, even though I have a project um, which is starting to explore the contours looking specifically at the, the, the community histories in South India and Dominica or, and the Caribbean, I felt it was much more appropriate given the nature of the, uh, the discussion of this forum to, to focus more in on work that I've uh, done more recently. And specifically in this talk, I'm going to be using the lens of water to examine an environment modified by slavery. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing on people who are legally defined as enslaved, but did not, uh, did not define themselves as such. Um, the predicaments faced by the enslaved were not unique. The Sugar Revolution, the event of this study, put direct competition in ordinary people's daily need to access soil, water, and other items with the manufacturing demands of goods detained, uh, destined for distant markets. Um, I'm going to follow basically th three broad items today. First is defining problems. I'm framing this talk primarily through the notion that um, enslavement was a condition in which people were forced to solve problems not of their own making um, through the lens of predicaments, an idea borrowed from Vincent Brown. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, myself and the group of people I worked with went about doing this archaeology of problem solving. I'm going to frame it around notions of climate change, but also a social archaeology of resilience. And then finally, I'm going to try and bring back this archaeological record to some present day concerns that people in Dominique and the broader Caribbean are facing. Um, I'd like to hot. I'd like to begin by highlighting that the transition that I'm studying, the sugar revolution, was not the first political economic transition in the Americas that centered local and elite tensions over soil and water, hydrosocial manipulation, agricultural intensification, and their social control are very much part of the story of chiefdoms, states, communities of all sorts in the Andes, the Maya region, North America, as well as parts of South America, including Guyan. Nor was the sugar the last commodity to transform the Americas, including Dominica, as recently noted about water, water tensions in Mexico City, Bolivia, the United States, and then also in Dominica. Now, when Dominica was intensively settled by Europeans, um, the, world, the, the world in which people were living in the Caribbean had already been humanized for several millennia. And I will get into this in a brief future. The place I'm looking at, Dominica, is of, uh, of considerable interest, not just to me, but to a whole series of archaeologists for a variety of reasons. First, it was at an interface between different pre-Columbian communities that, um, that formed the ancestors of those who would actually meet uh, Europeans when they entered into the Americas, but also because it has a unique history of being one of the last um, islands in the Caribbean to be formally colonized by a European nation. It wasn't until 1763 that the island had lost its state, had lost its official status uh, 
as a uh, as a neutral territory devoted for a resilient Kalinago people. Um, as such, as a place of looking at pa at the past and about how people confront problems, it becomes an ideal setting to imagine the way in which environment and enslavement uh, work hand in hand in terms of European colonialism. Now, I frame this work again around the notion of problem solving for two reasons. First of all, I was taken and continue to be taken uh, by the way of defining enslavement, a term that Joseph Miller himself defined as a, a, a big term, a term beyond uh, the ability to narrow down into analytical utility for historians and archaeologists alike, and to think about it in terms of predicaments, the kinds of predicaments people would face in everyday life. Um, uh, the, the, the notion of predicament, as, as many of you are aware, was initially introduced by the American historian Vincent Brown to describe the predicament of belonging that went along with enslaved laborers in Jamaica. For me, what also becomes useful to think about in terms of managing everyday life are very basic predicaments and people had to negotiate ideas such as scarcity, belonging, as well as mobility. Indeed, we can look at the literature in the Caribbean and elsewhere where enslavement has a, has a rich documentary record and there's a, there's a contradiction between the legal status that defines the person as somewhat chattel property, but then the call of um, the capacities for people to move beyond that status in order to make plantation colonies work. I also like the idea of defining, uh, of problem solving in thinking in terms of colonialism, in part because it allows us to think about um, enslaved laborers as engineers of the past, people who were bringing episteme along with them, who were being used to, who were using this episteme uh, to go ahead and negotiate the context of everyday life. And indeed, it's things such as negotiating waterways, the, the channels and the currents between various islands that, um, that uh, enabled a local vibrant, uh, a local vibrant, um, uh, a local vibrant trade that supported the feeding of colonies during this time period. Now, for predicament, um, I define it as those challenges that emerge as people experience uh, as people experience changes in climate, customary practices, ways of living, and/or social relations. Um, and these predicaments are, as I said before, can be thought about in terms of how someone might go ahead and uh, um, feed themselves. In a, in a situation in which you have a highly centralized economy and people are, in a sense, having to be part-time food producers to make a living. You can also think about the kind of challenges in terms of moving around the landscape beyond the property boundaries in which they find themselves captive in order to get to food or in order to trade for goods that they require to furnish their households. And then finally, um, the, the, the issues of belonging, um, how people create a social order amongst themselves and the ways that, that those might go contrary to a uh, colonial regime. And predicament is also useful because it forces us to ask the qu questions, very serious methodological questions, especially when we're dealing with 18th century Caribbean world to constantly push ourselves beyond defining enslaved peoples just through their capacity to labor in the past and how that can kind of get reproduced in present day discourses, but also how we have to be very careful in examining the documentary record not to conflate slaveholder ideology with slave life in and of itself. And again, this is a, this is a rich scholarly tradition of which I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of. The predicament that many of the enslaved were facing were to take an island that was heavily wooded, densely forested, steep slopes, and with uh, very little in the way of what might be considered 
ideal land for the purpose of growing sugarcane and in essentially terraforming that land into something in which uh, landowners could profit. Um, the re part of the reasons why the island was a difficult island to convert into this very specific form of commodity was in part because of the slope, but also the need to, and requirement to manage water. This is a um, this is a, a image of Rosalie Estate, and I like this image in part because it gives you a sense of how just even in the initial setting up of this sugar colony after 1763, how much land had to be cut, how much woodland had to be cut down. It's also important to highlight that this sugar revolution was relatively short-lived, unlike Barbados, Jamaica, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Saint-Domingue. The, um, the, the profits off of sugar failed within the, started to fail within, by the 1820s and then the island converted into different forms of agricultural production. Um, in order to cut down that woodland, um, the planters who were mostly absentee at this period required the situated knowledge of enslaved laborers and Kalinago to make these plans formed in dis on a distant continent work in a place in which it was not uh, not possible to happen. In this case, they, they relied on what I would like to think of as the agronomic scientific knowledge of Africans who were having to manipulate land and water from places from which they were coming, but also relying on the knowledge of uh, indigenous Kalinago uh, for the kinds of, uh, kinds of plants that would ultimately work to sustain the colony. Just to focus on the indigenous, it's really important to understand that the folks who first, human beings who first entered into the Caribbean approximately 5,000 years ago were humanizing and, and transforming that environment considerably. considerably. Um, the, for, um, to be precise, humans entered and began to manipulate the insular Caribbean about 6,000 years ago. They and those who followed precipitated the extinction of a host, spe host of species, introduced others, and shaped the landscape through trees they felled, soils they modified, and the plants they cultivated. That being said, there are very few considerations about the physical geography of the Ca Caribbean and its implications for the relationships that people had come afterwards. Um, one of the things that I became very interested in, and especially on this, uh, especially in the Caribbean, is the presence or absence of water. Anyone who's spent a considerable amount of time here realizes it's a place of either absolute abundance or absolute uh, scarcity just by the seasonal precipitation cycles. Adding to that, um, you have when industrial production of agriculture comes in, uh, a, 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 a increased precarity of those water systems because it just so happens when um, the most amount of water is required for the, produce, for the production of sugar is also the dry month when there's the least amount availability of precipitation in uh, groundwater. So that was the kind of context I, I entered into this project. And so I developed a, a, a group of team, a, a team to answer a set of questions to think about how enslaved laborers and indigenous people went about solving the kind of precarity introduced. Um, the, the goals were pretty straightforward. It was included identifying predicaments and solutions, shaping the everyday ecologies and economies of people. This is the kind of bread and butter data that we as archaeologists are fairly good at um, ascertaining. Um, we also went about thinking about how Kalinago Africans and their ch children resolved these predicaments created during this one specific moment, the sugar revolution. And to highlight again, this began approximately around 1760s and then it continued well up into the 1810s. So it's in archaeological landscape terms, it's a relatively short period of time. 
And then most importantly, identifying whether the knowledge, whether memory and knowledge of prior solutions, the Kalinago, enslaved Africans, and then their children informed later ones. Um, to do this, I employed three different kinds of approaches. Uh, the first was really to draw on the really excellent long-term tradition of critical cartographies, looking at countermapping. Um, this included, this was a way to allow a discussion of situated knowledge regarding the landscape, including refugia, sacred groves, agrarian decision-making, and a very complicated landscape. Um, in a way, so that um, we could challenge notions where Dominica, which was considered a nature, an island filled with natural abundance, was actually a carefully crafted garden island, um, which required constant human manipulation. It all, to do this, we used multimodal research, including oral histories, participatory GIS, and community workshops. And this resulted in things such as identification of place names, sites of, uh, sites of significance, botanical heritage, and the relationship between these three. Um, so, for example, one of our my first uh, uh, one of the first endeavors was to go around walking the landscape with individuals um, representing different different kind of walks of society and getting place names and asking how those place names come about. The, um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a set of terms that are best transcribed from Creole, but they, they can refer in many different things. So for example, Mornfu has a, has a kind of double meaning associated with it, as well as Masak. Um, Asking questions allowed me to kind of start providing initial clues in where to situate places to look in terms of the archeological record. We also relied on landscape survey, um, thinking about identifying sites. So uh, places which were sites of intensive, perhaps mapped European inter interaction, off sites, places that were, uh, um, might have been known by uh, planters, but were primarily known by the enslaved, and then non-sites, places that were probably considered opaque to the relatively powerful. Uh, we used a suite of techniques that included everything from um, remote, remote methods of examination to traditional archaeological examination. And we also included environmental specialists to kind of track changes in the ambient biota and the kind of refugia that existed over time. And so what we were able to do is to provide that kind of archeological data that so many others have begun to speak about, Don Haraway, and Singh, to think about the ways in which you might have these locations of places. It also allowed us some of that data to kind of help illuminate some of the counter maps include that we were creating, including thinking about different ways to think about how islands were connected or how land masses connect, were connected with the islands. So for example, as we began to map the various uh, biota, it became clear that one of the ways to think about um, the Caribbean Sea is not so much as a body of water, but as a river that continued to extend from South America all the way up into the insular into the insular part of the Caribbean. And that also that when we think about these islands themselves, the channels were not so much natural barriers, but natural causeways that brought people together. And so when we think about the territorial limits of colonialism, French versus the English, the channels were not political boundary. They might have been political boundaries for the European uh, landowners, but they were indeed uh, methods of movement and communication between uh, islands of opposing powers. This then provided an excellent set of data through which to compare and understand against the documentary record. Uh, because that archaeological work, because of the oral history, it became absolutely clear that this, the research needed to be transnational. It needed to take into account not only English, uh, the, the archaeological, the archival records in Great Britain, 
but those found in a variety of sources, including uh, France, the Netherlands, as well as North America. And it started that that archaeo that textual information was incredibly helpful in terms of filling out some of the kind of understandings of what the labor regimes were like in day to day, but also some of the kind of opportunities that enslaved laborers could take advantage of. So this was the kind of framework in which I, we wanted to go ahead and start thinking about how people in the past resolved issues of climate change. Now, I, I tend to like to borrow from Andy Bauer um, and Mona Bond's work in terms of thinking about climate. They define it as an assemblage constituted by the interrelationships and dependencies among a multiple multitude of different materials, things, and organisms. I really like this definition because it works very well with the archaeological record. We tend to think of things in terms of assemblage, not only the way that we might talk about kind of intimate assemblages in, in the lines of Donna Haraway or metabolic assemblages that we might think of in terms of the maybe more Marxist approaches or even genealogical, but also archaeological assemblages. What are we seeing and what might what might we not be seeing given issues of toponymy and power that exist in the archeological record. In terms of it, it's also very useful because it centers, the, it centers the human scale in it. And so when we think about climate change as an assemblage, we can think not only of the kind of impact of plantation agriculture in Dominica itself, but we can also think about for those individuals abducted from the Sahel, brought to the uh, slave castles, uh, the, the slave trading castles along the West African and Southwest African coast from Senegal down to uh, Angola, and think about the kinds of ways in which the climate changed for them as they were entering into this new world, which had different relationships with water, different relationships with soil and different people. And so we have to think about climate. I really like thinking about climate change in those two ways. It's really easy or relatively easy to see in the environmental record when climate change begins associated with uh, sugar cultivation. These are this is a graph representing soil cores from the island of uh, Martinique. This is not my work. This is a work of a colleague. And these, they go around to different lake bodies and collect these really dense, these soil cores that provide a column of different periods of time. And they can chart changes in the different kinds of trees or plants that constitute the ambient biota. And one of the things that you see in this case in, in Martinique is that pretty much the minute you start having the first sugar plantations appear on this island around three, 300 years ago, you see a dramatic transformation in the kinds of plants that are just existing. And this, we can, it, it's easy to extrapolate that this is not just an issue of the, 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 the botanical heritage that exists there, the deforestation that goes on, but we can also think about the various ant, um, um, uh, non-human animals that also are being brought in, some of which might seem ecologically benign, but are actually fairly ecologically benign, but others which are devastating to the landscape. And I, I can only think of, in a couple of cases, cattle, goats, cats, who just ravage the land. Sugar has an added issue, not just in terms of requiring kind of an extensification of agriculture. It is the second or third thirstiest crop that humans rely on. Um, rice is probably the first thirstiest crop followed by, by sugar and cotton. And it has a fairly narrow distribution pattern across the world. Uh, it is primarily equatorial in nature and it tends to follow a seasonal production in which its harvesting is required during the dry seasons. And so we could actually see how 
um, we have issues of water scarcity emerging almost immediately as when the English enter in. We start seeing cisterns, uh, methods to capture precipitation to hold water instead of people relying on groundwater or river water. Um, now, the cisterns themselves, these masonry structures that would hold precipitation, were th their use was limited to a relatively few number of people, specifically uh, the, the people who either owned or managed the properties. The majority of the people relied on basically other forms or methods of control of capturing uh, precipitation. The term that was used at the time was a two pond, and these what would happen is enslaved laborers would manipulate shallows in the landscape and line it with clay and that would capture water. This would also be water that either domesticated animals such as cattle or wild animals would come and utilize themselves as well. And so with sugar, we actually see a huge transformation of the availability of soil and the availability of water. The second thing we see is just a massive importation of human beings. Uh, again, most of the people coming to the Caribbean were coming uh, from Central and, and, and Central West and, and West Africa. Um, you know, in North America, I always like to highlight that the island of Barbados, an island that's roughly the size of the city I live in, Chicago, had as many enslaved laborers imported into it as the entirety of the North American colonies that would constitute the United States. Um, in Dominica, during its brief time period of legal slave trade, which was between 17, uh, just before the 1760s up until 1807, this meant that approximately 100,000 people were brought to its shores. Not all of them stayed. Some of them were transshipped elsewhere. But a population of approximately 20,000 people were the, was the laboring population on this island. So even with the consideration that, let's say, half of the population was, ex, uh, was, was transshipped, what that means is that there was an enormous amount of uh, cost to life and livelihood for the people brought to the island. The graph on the left is just uh, the gray bars are the number of enslaved laborers brought during a particular decade or during a particular half decade. And the line is the, the population at that time. Um, on the right hand side are two enclaves I looked at. Um, and the lower right hand uh, is a place in which you had a lot more people who were uh, who were enslaved who were born in the island and on the right hand side most of the enslaved laborers that worked those fields uh, were were uh, brought from West Africa. It should be noted as well that most of the enslaved in the northeast or on the upper right hand side were actually also working on sugar estates. So how did we go about studying this, studying resilience of folks dealing with this change? Um, you know, one of the things that I was very much interested in is drawing on the large body of literature that looks at kind of massive scale climate change and other parts and times in the world. Um, you know, we can think about places in the, the, um, the ancient Middle East, or we can think about Mesoamerica as locations where this study, ha this kind of work has been done and theorized. And, and I didn't want to dismiss that just because we had an, a rich archeological record. Um, I was also very much interested in thinking about the ways in which the environment itself became a method of governing the enslaved and those who enslaved it. Um, and this is work that's drawn on by Arun Agraval, among others, to think about the environmentality, uh, the environmentality of slavery. And then finally, it was the I, I, I'm I was mostly inspired by the work of uh, his historians and geographers, specifically the black the the work of critical geographers like uh, Kevin Kittrick and uh, that, that kind of frame these alternative geographies and black geographies to think about the way in which that the, the view 
from the imperial point of view of a place like Dominica did not necessarily represent the way that people engaged with their landscape. And the goal here was to think about a counter mapping of the environmental engagement of the enslaved. Now, as an archaeological problem, there are certain there's a series of elements of this. First of all, the archaeological record, especially in this part of the world, is a very difficult archaeological record to see. It's structured by the natural systems. Um, this uh, it is ve the, the um, even masonry structures that were built 150, 200 years ago, unless they're quickly well maintained, are quickly um, are quickly destroyed by the growth of trees such as ficuses, the constant uh, dry and wet season, as well as soil erosion. This visibility is also structured by social systems. It is a fairly easy thing to see the factory, the estate house, the plantation works in an archaeological landscape. What is incredibly difficult is the ability to locate where the majority of the people were living. Enslaved laborer houses were primarily built out of uh, wattle and daub, plank wood, or, or other kinds of perishable materials, which means that all, oftentimes all that is left is a scatter of architectural remains, is a scatter of nails or the impression or the staining of soils that make the post holes in which houses were elevated. And so it really required a series of different approaches, including walking over the landscape. And this is uh, one of my dear colleagues, Edward Thomas, him and I were trying to locate where uh, an enslaved village of about approximately 150 people were located. And oftentimes it just required looking in recently plowed fields for bananas in this case to see if there were densities of artifacts that might indicate their presence. And so what, what ends up is a landscape that in which you have um, people living in relative close proximity to each other, but one in which you might not actually be able to find the places where people lived. So for, during this process, we were actually fairly successful. Um, on the upper part of this map, you actually see the overall estate of, um, of Dominique, uh, of Morin Patat, one of the many plantations we looked at. Um, and what I'd just like to highlight is that there's three major areas of interest here. There's the first one that I've called Locus One in a very uninteresting way. And that's basically the estate center. It's where the, the, the estate house is. And then in the middle part of the field, middle part of the, the map is, are the various, uh, is the location of the slave village. And then all the way on the right hand side is the garden or one of the provision grounds from which enslaved laborers made a living. Um, what was great about this one site and the other ones that I looked at Dominica is that we were actually able to locate not only where people lived and compare, let's say, class and status between enslaved laborers and the planter and then even within, within the, the community, but we were actually able to link it to sites of refuge, so the gardens in which they grew their food. Um, the other very interesting thing about this landscape, it was, it's a palimpsest. It, was, it had been occupied for over 500 years in which you had Kalinago living there up until the 18th century, and then later uh, enslaved laborers living there until the 19th century. And so we get a, a kind of window into a before and after this sugar transformation, and most importantly, because we have an examination of the kind of household and the domestic wares that people had, we could see the way that people accommodated this transformation. This included everything from fairly easy things to identify, such as uh, ceramic materials and, and utensils, such as this oil lamp in the light lower right-hand corner, cassava griddles to make cassava bread in the left-hand side, or even um, or even kind of more cooking pots, as you see in the upper right-hand side, but also other kinds of things, uh, the kinds of crafts that people participated in on a daily basis.
Um, and these goods allowed me to center on kind of three ways of thinking through this notion of predicament. One was this issue of belonging, the second through, through this issue of mobility, and then through scarcity. Now, predicament, again, is an idea that I like because it really kind of breaks a problem down into the kinds of ways that people faced it. And um, there's just a couple things that really, I think, really look well at the intersection of what everyday life looked like with the development of sugar plantations. There's the work that I've already referenced about water by myself, but then also more recently, uh, there's been a lot of very interesting look um, in South Asia where with the development of plantation agriculture, you also see an increase in parasite loads uh, in, in, um, in commensurate species. And so we can think about the different kinds of challenges that might not actually be visible directly in the archeological record, but are still a present absence, still something that shapes people's daily lives. Um, so some of the predicaments that we, we documented at Moor and Patat included an increased village density. You have a population of enslaved laborers moving from somewhere around 30 to a population of circa around 150 associated with the sugar revolution. You have a disruption of commercial circuits that enslaved laborers relied on due to the, the near constant warfare that Britain and France were engaged in. You have the forced removal of the village when land was sold. And then finally, you actually have absolute soil loss, the soil upon which people grew their food um, with all of the deforestation became something that became precarious. Uh, the annual dry and wet cycles, it has, the, uh, it has the effect of creating unstable soil. So when you have a dry season, it, it hardens up and it's unable to absorb high amounts of water. And then when the wet season comes, it basically flows it downhill. Um, just to give you a sense in these three elements, I hope this is visible, but on the left-hand side, you have basically four structures that are associated with the village in 1763. In the upper right-hand side, uh, these are the, these are approximately 15 slave village, slave households that are associated with 1780s. And then by the 1820s, well after Morn Patat is, ceases to grow sugar, you have the height of the number of enslaved laborers living there in which you have approximately, uh, you, you have 22 buildings as best as we can identify. If we imagine that there's at least five to six people living in each of one of these structures, we can see that there's just a huge density. This contributes to taxation of local resources such as water and land, but also introduces issues of parasite load, disease, and other sorts of issues that impacted everyday life. Soil loss, um, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this is just a little trench that we excavated on the site. And what you can see is that basically there's 243 years that equates to 27 centimeters in the lower right hand side. And then within the 27 years of the sugar revolution, you have 135 centimeters of soil deposition. What you can imagine is all of that soil is coming from deforested land and just being drained in all of these bottom, all of these flat, low-lying areas. And again, this is, this is something that would have not just affected the people living where the landslides occur, but it would have been affecting the gardens in which they lived. Um, the other thing we see is a breakdown of the commercial networks associated with um, everyday life. This is, a, um, this is a, just a picture of some of the materials we got from the early component of the site before the sugar revolution occurred. And what you see is a fairly rich material life of the enslaved. You have items, uh, you have items, tablewares that one might find anywhere in the French Atlantic world. You find items of utilitarian manufacture again. And then you even find, I've never seen so many coins on an archeological site. 
and this is a cache of 1763 French Sioux, you know, pennies that were minted for a particular expedition that was done in Guyon. The presence of this in a slave household really tells you the degree into which um, the, the, these people were connected to a broader world. What we see after the French Revolution is a real change in those commercial networks, something in which gets really reoriented much more likely, uh, much more uh, locally. And then finally, just to go back to water, we see a change in the water table. Each of, the, each of these features that you see here, so in the left-hand corner or left-hand side, you see a circle filled with water. Right-hand side, you see a little uh, a, a, a cylinder coming out of the ground. And on the top, you see a little circle. These were all wells that were, were built by um, farmers before the British formally colonized the island. The minute the minute sugar was brought in, these wells, well, not the minute, but within 10 years, these wells became useless because the water table dropped so significantly. And each of these wells was converted into a cistern of its own right. So in other words, they took this, this area that was permeable to the groundwater and they sealed it on the bottom to capture rainwater. Um, and it's important to note that that water table never returned. I also like this picture on the lower right hand side because it also just illustrates well the level of soil loss associated with the sugar revolution. Um, and then the one thing that the enslaved did have was the continued use of water captured from precipitation to rely on. But this in itself uh, created its own challenges. Um, because this water was in close contact with both domesticated, commensal, and wild animals, you know, not only to drink, but it's present to the defecant, but also animals might die near it. Um, you did have an increase in waterborne diseases, and it's, the data is not consistent, but where we do have information about uh, slave mortality, um, and this is from uh, a register in 1817, we see that the majority of the deaths that cannot be explained by age are actually coming from uh, diseases associated with either transmission through water or issues with water. Um, so people living in these contexts had were forced to kind of solve problems. And um, one of the ways I like to think about this were thinking that first, the, the sugar revolution differentially impacted enslaved life. Whether it was an estate manager or a planter, their lives had much greater longevity uh, than the enslaved laborers working on Dominica. And so that the enslaved were forced to come up with everyday acts of conservation to conserve soil, to conserve land, reorganization, to kind of think about how to reproduce a social sense of belonging, and um, ways to develop community links and forge uh, networks that went beyond the plantation and island pop, uh, boundaries of the island. And so the, house, the set of household materials we excavated were at really, really important in helping us understand that. Um, the materials allowed us to think about uh, increased reliance on localized subsistence strategies. So one of the great interesting kind of things that we documented is that the more globalized this economy became, at least in terms of its export crops, the more locally reliant people became in terms of feeding themselves. That an informal, dense, multinational trading network emerged that was not documented in the customs records of either the French or uh, British uh, accounts. And there was a degree of spatial experimentation in terms of how to accommodate the various changes in the land. Um, because we had access to gardens, we could document the various refugia that people relied on. And I'm happy to go into greater detail a little bit later on, but the kinds of goods that we found were um, 
the kinds of goods that are sometimes hinted at in the documentary record. So we find items such as, um, we, we find uh, botanical remains associated with items such as uh, 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 West African cultigens, including, um, but we also find um, things that we did not expect to see. So interestingly enough, we found uh, barley uh, that was being grown and harvested here. Uh, we also find in the households commodity, uh, botanical remains of things that we thought might be associated with commodity production, including coffee beans. And it's important to note that we don't have much of a documentation of coffee. And then we also find um, uh, nurtured local species that are utilized by the enslaved, such as guava. guava. Now, we can think about the economic uses of all of these, and that's really incredibly important to think about how guava, for example, might be turned into guava jelly uh, that could be then sold on a local market. But we can also think about how some of these species might also help in some of the other predicaments that are associated with plantation agriculture. Guava trees, for example, have a wonderful ability of their root system not only engaging in the topsoil, but going into the hardened subsoil that might anchor uh, destabilized soils from deforestation and protect gardens. You might also think about how some species of plants uh, could be used to kind of demarcate, uh, demarcate different plots of land. Um, and most importantly, you can think about how some of these plants might be used as medicinal cures for many of the parasites that were produced. One of the kinds of species of, of plant life that we found that we did not expect to uh, was fennel. And fennel was actually something that uh, had developed into a kind of local bush tea at the time period, but only after we had found, uh, we had only realized this after we had documented it archaeologically. Another item that was very interesting that we found in the, in the kind of refuge assemblages were the animal species that we ran across. Um, now, we've, we, we ran across a fairly typical set of dietary bone that one might expect at any, time, at any place during this time period. This would include things like um, pig, uh, uh, probably also uh, some degree of goat. In some cases, though very minimally, we had bovine or, 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 or cow bone. We had an enormous amount of pelagic fish. In other words, fish that, uh, was harve that was harvested locally from fairly well off the shore. In fact, you would find it basically within the channel between Martinique and Guadeloupe. And what was particularly interesting is that we only found certain kinds of bones associated with it that did not have to do with the natural preservation of this material. So one of the things we suspect that was happening is, is that plantation fishermen were going out, uh, catching this fish, but then also bringing it on shore and finding ways to preserve it, much like salt fish, but using local methods, including uh, drying and smoking. My favorite piece of dietary animal information, however, was the presence of, of these small amphibian bones. The, there's a frog here called Crapo, or it's the giant ditch frog. In to present day, they call it mountain chicken. This is a, this is a frog that goes ahead and um, it, it's one of the few frogs that lays its eggs on land. It's very large. It provides a lot of caloric intake and it's fairly easy to hunt. In fact, it's such an easy item of prey to human hunters that on every other island in the region, it was hunted out by the 18th century. Dominica was able to maintain, or the, 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 the woodland of Dominica continued to have high abundance of crapo up until the early 1990s when the tourist industry and the discussion of this frog as the national dish and a blight kind of made it precarious and endangered. 
Why this is interesting is amphibians are oftentimes excellent indicators of forest health. And so what we probably see here is a management of woodland reserves. Um, just a few other things that we find thinking about how enslaved laborers met their predicaments is that they engaged in craft industry, taking items such as broken pottery and turning it into what we call gaming pieces. They also took things such as roofing slate and they turned it into buttons. And we can imagine how they were selling this amongst each other as part of a sartorial wear. And we can also think about how enslaved laborers were actually crafting the very stuff of their everyday life, including water. Um, so one of the things that people relied on to take that very murky water that was coming out of those DuPonts and converting it into something that was not only probably healthier, but also much more palatable, was a reliance on local coarse earthenware. Now, importantly, none of this earthenware was actually made in Dominica itself. Um, we were able to use a variety of techniques to talk about the kind of dense networks that was used to transport that earthware, earthenware from potteries in Martinique, uh, St. Lucia, as well as Guadeloupe, into Dominica. Importantly, in the customs records of the, uh, of the British, there is very few mentions of the kind of density of earthenware that we see here. So this is most likely pottery brought in through informal means, through basically what are called cavateurs. And there are two, like, most likely two agents who transported these goods. The first are the fishermen who were capturing that pelagic fish. Um, and then the second were most likely the colonago, who continued to engage in trade between the islands well up until the 20th century. In fact, uh, the last kind of military conflict that happened in Dominica was what was called the Carib War. And it was in the 20th century and the British took um, a military vessel off the coast of the Colonago territory and shelled it to keep people from selling goods to Martinique and Guadeloupe. What we can imagine then is with these kind of networks, we not only have a way in which water was being crafted to kind of meet household needs, but also social links and idioms of understanding different ideas of water began to be shared between these various islands. And so we start to develop a counter map that does not necessarily look at the po political boundaries, but the social and cultural sinews that linked uh, people who were normally left out of the documentary record. So one of the things we see, for example, is a proliferation of very similar kinds of types of water amongst these communities as, as documented by European travelers. Um, and we also see methods being shared across different places um, to, to, to clarify and, and filter that water. I think the biggest thing we noted is if we take these small finds and we fit it into the landscape, what we start to see is that in this very centralized, terraformed landscape, the enslaved laborers, these agrarian agents who are on the, the, the who are uh, conscripts to climate change, go ahead and start developing a decentralized water supply. They start um, borrowing ideas and methods from the Kalinago, and they start creating different ideas that still exist today as ways to think about water storage and also the ways to encounter the kind of issues either with the abundance or the decline of water. So one of the end results that we were hoping to think about is how much of this could be helping us to inform present day issues that are being faced in the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean, folk in the Caribbean have been on the forefront of solving climate problems and the Caribbean is a place that is on the forefront of change. Um, and to view the past and to view the archeological record of enslaved laborers as actually a record of problems solved, as a way to think about how people negotiated issues, becomes a very useful way to think of things that are people are challenging today.
Um, so for example, in Dominica, if we just want to think about the climate issues that people are facing right now, um, there's going to be, you know, this is, these are conservative estimates, but, you know, a conservative increase in mean temperature uh, from 0.7 to 2.6 degrees centigrade. Um, and then by the 29, 2090s, 4.3 degrees centigrade. This, this is going to have enormous impact on the kinds of plants that can be grown, where they can be grown, and when they can be grown. Rainfall will probably decre decrease by 21% by 2090. There's going to be an enormous change in the temperature of the, uh, the surface temperature of the ocean, which it faces. This is going to include, ex this is going to create extreme weather events, some of which we've already started to see by Hurricane Maria. And we're going to start to see a distinct, a, a, a reduction in the distinction between wet and dry seasons, the kind of seasonality that enables a landscape like Dominica to exist. Um, what this is going to mean ultimately is that there's going to be an increased loss of land uh, as sea levels rise. Many of the places where people find home are going to become much, uh, much narrower strips of land, but also there's going to be increased loss of land through soil erosion. Um, resources are going to become more narrow. And of course, you're going to have issues of migration, which tax these resources even further. Um, that's just to think about the human cost. If we were to think about the heritage cost, most of the archaeological sites in Dominica are located in a very narrow band along the, the waterfront, and most of those will disappear. And in fact, I'm working on a project right now that is associated with a, an early European settlement in the 7th, 16th century that is disappearing by uh, pretty much a meter every year. So one of the things we were hoping to bring together through the process of countermapping, working through the archeological record and, 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 and archival record is to think about some tangible outcomes that might help people encounter this. First is education. Now education includes necessarily working with uh, children from local primary schools, but also with adults. And so one of the things we, we, we worked with constantly was setting up a curriculum. Uh, this was a curriculum not just to teach about the past, but this was a curriculum to kind of talk about different kinds of strategies that are central in, in archaeology, such as problem solving, um, uh, spatial reasoning, thinking through issues of STEM, um, but also education for the local community. We had weekly seminars in which we not only reported on our results, but we sought feedback by community members on how that work might, the work we were presenting might be relevant in everyday life today. Um, we, we also, several projects developed out of this or in combination with it, including further work. So part of the goal here was to also develop a sustainable heritage infrastructure and so research continues along these lines to, to more explicitly look about how people negotiated environmental changes in the past 400 years. Uh, Professor Diane Wallman at the University of South Florida has taken up the mantle on this. Um, but there's also been new projects such as um, Adam Philogene Heron, who's at University of London, who's been looking specifically at applying these, these ideas that we've documented in the archaeological record and working with communities in various villages across the island today to see how they fit and work. It's, it's something he calls the Tikai project. And then finally, there's been a series of community efforts. Um, one of the things, the community that I was working in, Soufriere, one of the things that emerged in the wake of um, Hurricane Maria were three kinds of phases. First was kind of to decentralize the water and electrical supply upon which the community relied on. The second was to develop a jetty so that it could have its own commercial networks to the outside world and not rely on the precarious road that was built in the 1970s. And the third was to, to kind of think about more closely the kind of local and situated knowledge in the primary education of folks in the village. So I would like to thank you for bearing with me. I realize I went a few minutes long.
Uh, and I didn't realize I took too many slides, so I apologize about that, but uh, I'd be really super interested to hear any questions you might have. Mm -hmm.